All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to the uh, September meeting of the RASC. My name is Mike Modem. I'm glad you could make it. Um, I always like starting the meeting asking questions. And Chris, could you just for one sec turn the, light, the late lights on? Because I want to see some hands in the, uh, in the audience. Uh, um, if you could turn the lights back on. So my first question to ask is, well, welcome to, um, to the uh, people who are, have never been here before. Uh, maybe you could just let me know who's, who's first time. Okay, that's interesting. So that's really, um, uh, thanks, for, thanks for coming. Also curious to see how many people are, uh, quite a few in fact, how many people have heard about this event through the, uh, our new Ottawa Astronomy uh, Meetup group? So, okay, so uh, that seems to be doing something for us. All right, terrific. Yeah, we launched that uh, uh, Oscar, what was it, what, three weeks ago? Uh, I think just a little over three weeks ago. And um, it's a new uh, internet tool that allows us to uh, connect people with common interests. So we're hoping that that'll uh, generate more interest in our events and, um, and, uh, and uh, hopefully pe more people can enjoy what, what we do here. Uh, let's go to the uh, next slide. And Chris, you can probably uh, turn down the uh, lights again, please. OK, my, um, I'm betting that by the end of this evening, you're going to know a few things that maybe you might not have known at the beginning of the evening. Um, Dave Chisholm will be talking about uh, prominent objects in the, uh, in the September night sky, what to, what to, what to see and what to, what to note. Um, Gerard Kuiper is, um, is some, a, a, a historical figure that some of you probably recall from, um, from uh, his, uh, his prediction of the, uh, of the uh, Kuiper belt, okay, this uh, far out in the solar system uh, a band of, um, of uh, Many, many, many different uh, um, rocks and, and, and dust and 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 uh, and, and, and uh, solid matter, let's say, uh, way out in the far reaches of the solar system. Uh, there's much more to Gerard Kuiper, uh, and in fact, uh, Carmen Rush will be uh, will be uh, sharing a historical account of uh, of uh, his life and his and his. Uh, and uh, she'll be presenting with a typical verve that she, uh, we uh, come to ex come to. I don't want to say ex expect, but Carmen, you always you always blow us away. I always feel like I should be serving wine and maybe starting a fire in the corner. It's very relaxing. Okay, it's um, and uh, and maybe I'll have popcorn too. <laughs> so, but uh, Car Carmen will be. Um, Carmen will be uh, talking about uh, Gerard Kuiper. Uh, Rob Dick will be talking about uh, Star, Star Fest. Uh, it's a huge festival that uh, run by the North York Astronomy Association. And um, he'll be t t talking about the highlights of uh, what happened in 2015. And then we'll have our break. During our break, we'll uh, have our, for those of you who haven't been here before, we have door prizes that are open to an, uh, everyone. We have tickets that you give out. And, um, and uh, if we call your number at the end of the meeting, you can come and pick up uh, a, a, a door prize. We have quite a few of them, so your chances of getting something are, are, are quite high, I think. Um, some really nice ones. They're all astronomy-themed door prizes. Um, those of you who know Chuck O'Dale know that he's our, um, our, uh, our uh, impact crater uh, enthusiast, expert slash enthusiast. So Chuck went on a journey, a uh, pretty big journey. And uh, as, you, as for those of you who know Chuck, you know he's our, sort of our Indiana Jones of, uh, of an impact crater uh, and he he, is, he does a lot of flying. He takes uh, shots of uh, of um, from uh, from an airplane. He'll be he'll be uh, he'll be sharing with you uh, a lot of his uh, a lot of his uh, observations and, and, and findings. And uh, no doubt he'll probably leave you with the impression that your your house is probably on an impact crater because there's so many of them around. Um, then uh, Bob Olson will be sharing some of uh, our new uh, segment on observer challenges. Or I should, or we used to have ages ago, we brought back recently. So Bob is, is, will be suited for that. And as you know, we have a sex segment both on uh, for uh, novice observers and, and, and for an advanced observers. And then uh, we have a ton of announcements that are sort of peppered throughout this, um, this uh, talk tonight. And uh, if you, I encourage you, if you have a pencil, you know, have it ready because there's a ton of astronomy events that uh, uh, clinics, astronomy events, stargazing events, uh, public events, you name it. So there's, there's quite a few. It's a very, very, very active time of the year. Um, did anybody go to the star party last uh, week, the, star, the public stargazing? Another set of hands? Okay, quite a, a couple of hands. Oh, yeah, quite a few hands. Yeah, so that was a blockbuster event. So um, it seems that we seem to be reaching our stride with those events. We're really delighted about that. There's another one coming up in October. I think October, Saturday, October the 3rd is the first scheduled date. We'll be talking more about that as well. But uh, we're, I, I really feel like we've, uh, we're doing something um, really good. Okay, I don't want to take too much time here. Let's move to um, next slide. Oh yes, um, a couple of things. Uh, I'd like to welcome as new members, uh, uh, Kyle, Jordan, uh, uh, Andrek, 
uh, Richard, Ethan, Jeff, uh, Julia, uh, the daughter of our, pre our club president, and, and, and Sandy. If you're here tonight, come say hi. I'd love to find out what, what, uh, what drew you to here and uh, what your interests are, and I'd like to make sure that you're plugged into all of the events that we do. That all together we have 39 mm -hmm. new members. So, uh, good, good to see you. Okay, what were you, Dave, oh, on what's to, what to see in the September skies? Yep, okay, thank you. Okay, for the uh, September skies. Works, great, okay. So here are the, uh, the moon phases uh, for, for September. Our uh, full moon is on the 27th, and you see it's a special color. Um, I'll explain that in just a minute. Um, total lunar eclipse on the uh, 27th. This is an interesting website that was just brought to my attention. Now, um, we're not doing anything here in, in Ottawa. In fact, in Canada, there's a, an event in Edmonton and a couple down in Nova Scotia. Uh, maybe this is something we can look at for next year, the International Observe the Moon Night. It's on the 19th of September. Uh, the website is, is on there. There's some interesting resources on that website, so I encourage you to go there. Okay, this is the big event for this month. We have a total lunar eclipse, and we are actually going to be gathering here at the museum uh, starting around 9 o'clock. It's pretty boring up until then. At 9.07, the excitement starts as the, uh, as the bite is taken out of the moon, and um, uh, we're going to be gathering here at the museum uh, starting at 9 o'clock, and I encourage you to be there. In terms of the planets, uh, Mercury is uh, not visible at all this month. Neither is Venus or Mars, Jupiter. It's a pretty quiet month. Saturn, however, is visible. Uh, it's visible all month. It's pretty low in the sky, uh, and uh, eventually it's going to disappear as well. Uranus and Neptune are visible all month. The International Space Station, best viewing date is September the uh, 24th. And um, it's early in the morning. If you want to get up for that, it rises to 81 degrees. This is a, a picture of where it is in the sky. And I leave you with this closing cartoon. I don't know if this has ever happened to any of you. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Dave, I think you set the land speed record for uh, for the uh, the, the um, what's up in the uh, in the month sky. Uh, that was a uh, thanks for doing that so quick. We have uh, we have quite an agenda tonight, so we're all concerned about um, the uh, time. Okay, next up is Carmen Rush. Carmen, as you know, is as a as um, as a uh, historical figures in astronomy uh, um, series that she has done over the last two years. It's something that I uh, I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoy. Those of you who know Carmen know that she's a very, very detailed researcher. So the, you know, what you'll be hearing tonight is the culmination of weeks and weeks of research over, uh, t t from tons of different sources. So my bet is you're gonna walk away saying, I know a lot more about this, uh, about this very uh, important fellow. So please welcome Carmen Rush. I think I'm gonna be brave and use this knife. Right. 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 right one? Okay. This time I'll give poor Chris a rest, rather than saying, next slide, next slide, I'm going to try it myself. Uh, so I hope you enjoy the story for tonight, but first of all, I want to thank um, Mike Mogadam and uh, Jim Thompson for su suggesting that I do a talk on uh, Gerard Coper. Um, also, uh, Chris Tarrin for reformatting all of my slides. There are 53 of them, and don't worry, you will not be here till midnight. Um, I, I'm going to be going through them uh, quite rapidly at some points. Uh, but anyway, he really uh, put in a huge effort to uh, get them all done on time, so I thank you for that. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to expand on the information that Jim gave you uh, in his talk earlier this year about the moon atlases from the uh, 1960s. Uh, previously, actually, I had only heard of uh, the name Coper because of the Coper belt, and I had no idea that Gerard Coper was such an accomplished scientist with such a fascinating biography. So Gerard Peter Coper, and in Dutch, Gerrit Peter Coper, uh, was born in Harenskarspel in the Netherlands on December 7, 1905. Uh, his father was a tailor, and Gerard was the oldest of four children. And from the beginning of his schooling, he was an excellent, excellent student. 
Uh, his first plan actually was to be an elementary school teacher, uh, and he went to the appropriate high school in Harlem to direct him to that uh, profession. Uh, this school did not permit uh, students to go to university. But he was a very bright student, and uh, he started to get very ambitious. So on his own, he studied for the very difficult entrance exam to the very prestigious Leiden uh, University and passed the exam in 1924. And this sudden change in career was in part due to his grandfather, who gave him a small telescope. Uh, Coper loved to sketch what he saw. He had excellent vision. Uh, apparently, he could see magnitude 7.5 stars with naked eye, and that's about four times fainter than what normal vision can see. He was fascinated with astronomy and uh, inspired by Descartes' writings. Um, already by first year, in, uh, first year in university at Leiden, he knew that he wanted a career studying astronomy, and uh, this was despite being looked down upon by uh, the rest of the students there, because they all knew that his high school education had been inferior, even though he had self-studied. That didn't seem to matter. Um, nevertheless, he remained very driven and persistent and self-confident, uh, and those were traits that actually in, a, in his later life uh, were to make him rather difficult to work with. So he completed his uh, BSc in 1927 and continued on to postgraduate studies. And he studied under some of the most famous scientists of the century. And I have a number of pictures of these gentlemen because I've heard these names so often I never knew what these men looked like. So the first one was uh, Ejnar Hertzsprung. Um, he classified stars by relating color to brightness, um, the famous Hertzsprung-Russell diagram of uh, stellar types. Jan Oort. Uh, he studied the Milky Way, radio astronomy, the Oort cloud, which I'm going to talk about later, uh, of comets. Anthony Panenkuk, Mark Ehrenfest, he was um, um, a specialist in statistical mechanics and quantum mechanics, um, and actually Koper uh, tutored their son. Will Willem de Sitter, Jan Walter. Um, his doctoral thesis was on binary stars, and this remained his most loved study, although he uh, did digress from that many uh, times in his career. Uh, in 1929, he went to Sumatra on an eight-month solar eclipse uh, expedition, and he saved the day when, at the last moment, he realigned the spectrograph slit on the camera to obtain uh, correct measurements. Uh, so his excellent professional skills were already becoming very well known. In 1929, he began correspondence with Robert um, Grant Aiken, who was doing double-star astronomy at Lick Observatory uh, at the uh, University of California. So after receiving his doctorate in 1933, uh, Coper decided to move to the US and work with Aiken there in, in California. It was an offer he couldn't refuse, uh, because there he had access to the state-of-the-art 36-inch uh, reflector and refractor, and he was able to improve um, his previous measurements of double stars, and he discovered many more binaries and white dwarfs. Uh, he gave the binaries Coper numbers, maybe a little bit egotistical, uh, for example, KUI 79 and so on. Um, and while at the University of uh, California, Coper was once again in contact with, the with renowned astronomers f because Aiken himself had learned from E.E. E. Bar Barnard, who in turn had worked under S.W. Burnham, if you remember the Burnham volumes, catalogs. Uh, unfortunately, though, Coper's abrasive personality worked against him. Uh, when Aiken left the Lick Observatory, Coper was not offered his post, and this was something that uh, really uh, made him very angry. So angry was he that in 1935 he moved to Harvard College University at Cambridge. Actually, that proved to be very uh, lucrative for him personally because he met and married his wife there, Sarah Parker Fuller, uh, and uh, she actually came from a very wealthy family, and uh, her family had donated the land where the observatory was built. At the same time, Koper received an offer from both uh, Bosha Observatory in Java, Indonesia, and also from Otto Struve, uh, the director of Yerkes Observatory at the University of Chicago. At that point, he was very torn between the two. Uh, and finally, after much consideration in November 1935, he chose Chicago. And actually, that was a very fortunate choice for him, because had he chosen Java, he would have been captured by the Japanese when they invaded the island, uh, the islands in the Second World War. And uh, like my Dutch grandfather, who was a teacher there at the time, he would have been in, uh, in turn, like my, father, my grandfather was, in a Japanese concentration camp. And now, luckily, my grandfather survived after four and a half years of captivity, but uh, perhaps Coper would not have been that uh, lucky. At the University of Chicago, Coper was appointed associate professor from 1937 to 1943, and then full professor after that. And it was the height of stellar astrophysics. 
Struver wanted to rebuild and rejuvenate the staff at the observatory, and he also ha hired these very famous people, uh, S. Chandrasekhar, uh, um, the uh, dis discoverer and um, uh, developer of the theory of black holes, uh, the Chandrasekhar limit, and Bengt uh, Schrumgren. He was uh, studying the chemical composition of stars and invented photoelectric photometry. Cooper continued his work in the meantime on binary stars, and in uh, 1937, he published his famous color magnitude diagram for galactic clusters. In 1938, his work led to the foundation for a stellar uh, temperature scale, and in 1939, he helped Struve and others plan an 82-inch refracting telescope. It was the second largest in the world at the time uh, at the University of Texas, and it was to be jointly operated by Yerkes and uh, McDonald Observatory near Fort Davis, Texas. So uh, Coper then moved to that very remote site, took his family with him, very hard on them, but he was uh, you know, driven, and he uh, used this opportunity to stub, uh, study white dwarfs and uh, faint blue stars, and by 1942, he discovered 21 binary stars uh, with very tight and rapid orbits. Now comes the exciting part. Um, so at this time then, the, um, the US was getting involved in the Second World War, and Cowper's career took a very, very different turn. In 1943, he took a leave of absence from the University of Chicago, and he joined the Harvard Radio Research Lab to develop uh, radar countermeasures. And in 1944, he left for Europe to participate in a mission by the US War Department. And his job was to move with the advancing Allied forces across Germany, uh, and as German scientists were captured, it was his job to interview them and assess their work in nuclear and chemical research. And he was the perfect one for the job because he was fluent in Dutch, German, French, and English. So he was a very great asset to the, to the mission. And after the war, he also published the names of Nazi uh, sympathizers among the German astronomers he had met. And for all of this, the Queen of the Netherlands gave him a special award for his war efforts. This is another exciting story of the time. This is perhaps the most riveting story that I read about his life. Uh, this was in, uh, done in 1945, his dramatic rescue of the great scientist Max Planck, who was the founder of uh, quantum theory. Uh, Germany had just surrendered in May 1945, and Cooper's work was over. Um, Warner Heisenberg and his team had been arrested, and there was really nothing more that the Allies wanted to do. Um, but a captured German told Cooper that the 86-year-old Max Planck was hiding close by, but very ill. Apparently, he and his wife were forced out of their home in Berlin in a bombing raid. And all his scientific records were destroyed there, and Planck and his wife were forced to flee into the forest and seek shelter in barns of sympathetic farmers. Um, by now, the Russian front was advancing, and they were only 100 kilometers away, and the Allied forces were not at all interested in, in rescuing this elderly gentleman. Uh, but Coper took it upon himself. He convinced two GIs to accompany him uh, in a jeep without other, any other protection uh, to single-handedly rescue Planck, and they found him at a dairy farm and uh, successfully escorted him back to safety. So I'm going to digress a bit because upon reading that, I also read a little bit about Max Planck's life, and I really can't help but to tell you just a little bit about um, what he uh, dis um, had to put up with in his later life. So uh, Planck endured actually many personal tragedies um, after the age of 50. In 1909, his first wife died after 22 years of marriage, and he left him with two sons and two daughters. Uh, and then his older son, Carl, was killed in action in 1916 during the First World War. Uh, shortly thereafter, in 1917, his daughter Marguerite died in childbirth, and then his next daughter, Emma, uh, married her late sister's husband and then also died in childbirth in 1919. And in 1945, Max's younger son, uh, Erwin, uh, uh, who was working for the resistance, uh, was arrested uh, due to the attempted assassination of Hitler in, on, uh, in the Ju July th uh, 20th plot. And Erwin consequently was uh, tortured and died at the hands of the Gestapo. And his death destroyed very much of Max Planck's um, uh, will to live. And uh, he himself died shortly after the war in uh, 1947. But in those last years, um, he um, took it upon himself to uh, stay in Western Germany. And he guided the German top research organization, the Max Planck Institute, and continued his work in his field. Um, so back to Koper now. Uh, briefly, between 1943 and 1945, Cooper did return to the U.S., and he did some spectroscopic study of the planets and the satellites of Ju uh, Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, he was the first to discover that Titan, the largest moon of Saturn, had an atmosphere, mostly of methane. In 1947, he detected carbon dioxide on Mars and discovered ice on the rings of Saturn. 
1949, he was the first to interpret the composition of the atmospheres of Jupiter and Saturn. In spite of this prolific research, um, Cowper actually rarely worked with anyone. He only ever had a handful of students, that, graduate students, that ever dared to work with him in his entire career. Uh, uh, Daniel Harris, Alan Binder, the famous Carl Sagan, uh, Dale Cruikshank, who wrote a very detailed uh, biography of him, Bill Hartman, and only these, the handful of these gentlemen would work with him for all his years as a professor. And this was because he didn't like to teach. Uh, his first love was research. Um, he was a very hardworking man, um, but very demanding, very reserved, very authoritarian, very old school. And he expected his assistants to work 20 hours per week when they were hired for 10. Um, when graduate students accompanied him on two-week observing expeditions, he expected them to observe all night in freezing temperatures, accuse them of unprofessionalism and lack of dedication if they complained. However, Coper demanded the very same of himself and would work for 24, 24 consecutive days um, with his spectroscopic instruments. He survived on three to four hours of sleep uh, and would take catnaps of the observing platform to get him through it. Yet at the same time, he could be very outwardly uh, friendly, kind, very excellent conversationalist, um, very engaging. And the students who agreed to work with him knew that really they had it made because they were walk, uh, watching the best in action. And it didn't matter that he wasn't really a very good professor. Uh, they, they learned from being with him. And in fact, they were very loyal to him. And Coper was also very loyal and helpful to people in, um, in need. I guess that dates back to the war, what, uh, what he had come across. In 1963, he helped uh, Polish astronomer uh, Wisla Wisniewski uh, get a job at the uh, University of Arizona when the Russians were after him. In 1948, Coper found and named the fifth satellite of Uranus, Miranda. I'm just going to have to get a drink of water. That's my usual. I can tell when I hit the middle of my talk, I go dry. OK. <clears throat> and um, in 1949, he found Nere, the second moon of Neptune. And by this time, he had su succeeded, finally, in becoming the director of Yerkes Observatory, that he was driven to get that since uh, very early in his career, he did not. Uh, so he was uh, the director from 1947 to 1949. And it was at this time in 1949 that he formulated the theory of the creation of the solar system. He believed that the sun and the solar system uh, was basically a failed binary uh, because there was insufficient uh, mass to form a second star, so instead it coalesced into planets. Um, and so this uh, extra mass uh, moved out from the sun in a radial disk and later coalesced into these planets and satellites. And unlike his contemporaries, he thought that this occurred often and not rarely. Although the notion of this was first perform, uh, proposed by the philosopher Immanuel Kant, believe it or not, in 1755. By 1951, uh, Coper proposed that the gas and dust that was left beyond ne uh, Neptune would um, condense into the many smaller icy bodies. I have a little schematic for you to see. So there's the coalescing uh, sun, and then uh, the radial disk comes out, and uh, you end up having the planets around there. So what happens beyond that? So in 1951, Coper proposed that the gas and dust that was left beyond Neptune would condense in into many uh, smaller icy bodies. And it was from this region that the short period comets that orbit the sun and the, uh, in the in the same direction as the planets originate from this cloud as they were hurled um, into the solar system by the gravitational pull of Neptune. This belt is now called the Coper Belt in his honor. And it wasn't until 1992, uh, believe it or not, that the first Coper Belt object was actually discovered. And now there are over 200 of them that are, have been uh, observed. Pluto, which was discovered in 1930, is the king of the Coper Belt, has been demoted, but still the king out there. Um, <clears throat> But it's only two-thirds of the size of the Earth, uh, of the Earth's moon, rather. Uh, NASA's New Horizon space craft is now in the Kuiper Belt, and uh, it's been very successful so far, so let's hope it'll get a lot more information about these mysterious uh, Kuiper Belt objects. Uh, Kuiper was able to also explain how the Oort cloud, and Jan Oort is a gentleman I mentioned earlier, in, uh, another scientist that he worked with uh, at the University of Leiden, so Coper was able to explain how the Oort cloud, and you can surmise that for yourself, I won't say, you can have a read of this little comic. <clears throat> so in 
so he was able to explain how the Oort card, uh, cloud, named after his former colleague uh, J.H. Oort in 1950, was formed. He proposed that this large spherical cloud of objects, weakly held um, by the sun's gravitational pull, so there's a schematic of what that would look like, um, wouldn't coalesce in a radial plane. It would form like a sphere. And these clouds of objects would be held weakly by the, the sun's gravitational pull and would extend halfway uh, to the nearest stars um, originally, that originally came from the Kuiper belt, but were far enough away from the sun to be thrown out at random. So this was the source of long period comets, supporting, according to him, with very elliptical uh, orbits that enter the solar system at random angles. So this overall theory is rather simplistic um, because more recent theories prove that uh, it's not only gravity that's involved here, it's also magnetic and electric fields, they also play a role, but it's also an impressive body of work uh, uh, nonetheless. So needless to say, from 1950 to 1956, Koper uh, focused his study on comets, uh, Pluto, and also the Earth, Earth and the Moon. In 1952, he was elected president of the International Astronomical Union's Commission 16, <clears throat> whose mandate it was to study the planets and the satellites. And his first uh, focus was the surface of the moon. So he took careful photographs of the moon with a McDonald 82-inch uh, telescope and published a series of papers about them. And by 1957, he was once again appointed as director of the Yerkes Observatory. And it was then that he was contracted by the US Air Force to provide an atlas of the moon, the photographic lunar atlas, which Jim uh, Thompson earlier spoke of. And it was published in 1960. It was a collaboration with uh, Koper and uh, the Lick and Mount um, Wilson Observatory scientists. And at this time, the third uh, student of planetary science was none other than Carl Sagan. And Carl Sagan himself was not uh, just the, um, uh, you know, the TV show host. Um, <clears throat> he also discovered high surface temperature of Venus. Uh, he was a NASA advisor, um, and he did run the, the Cosmos series in the 1980s uh, on TV. And he was also a writer. But at that time, Koper was embroiled in a very bitter dispute with a colleague in the chemistry department. His name was Harald, uh, Harold uh, Urey. Uh, Urey argued that the moon was still volcanic, and Koper disagreed, and the dispute raged on and on and on in scientific uh, papers written by each of them. And Carl Sagan uh, later wrote that during this time, with all this arguing going on, he felt like the child of divorced parents. By 1958, Koper was in the middle of organizing four encyclopedia volumes of the Sun, uh, planets, Earth, satellites, comets, in a nine-volume encyclopedia of the stars and stellar systems. And he also confirmed that the polar ice caps on Mars were made of frozen water. Uh, the newly formed uh, National Aeronautics and Space Administration, in other words, NASA, then came calling because they heard of all this work he was doing with the moon. So in October 1957, um, when the Soviet Union launched Sputnik, the first man-made uh, satellite, this started the space race. So with the support from NASA, uh, Koper began to chart the lunar surface and study the characteristics of planets and asteroids. He was called upon to uh, interpret the advances of the Soviet Union uh, in the space race, and he worked with the CIA as they got information from a Yugoslavian uh, defecting uh, scientist. In the meantime, the staff and faculty at Yerkes and the University of Chicago were starting to become very angry with Koper because they accused him of stealing all the grant money uh, that, that was available for, um, for work for the university. He was hogging it all for himself. Uh, so in 1959, uh, Koper's appointment as a director of Yerkes was not renewed. And in a half, Koper resigned uh, as professor of the University of Chicago in uh, 1960, and then he moved to the University of Arizona in Tucson. Very very wise move. And actually, so did a number of supporters uh, at the university. Um, here you see the newly built Kitt Peak Observatory at their disposal. Um, Koper had the run of the place. He formed the Lunar and Planetary La uh, Lab, LPL for short. It was a multidisciplinary group of astrophysicists, geologists, atmospherics, uh, physicists, and chemists. And uh, Koper's career was definitely at its highest height. So with new improvements in infrared detectors and diffraction gratings, he was able to detect hot bands of carbon dioxide on Venus, low pressure areas on Mars, um, new um, absor absorption bands in the spectra of Alpha Orionis on uh, Chi Cygni, and water vapor in Omicron Ceti. 
and he collaborated with Gerhard Hertzberg uh, as well in the 1950s. And in 1962, a 61 inch NASA funded telescope was built near Tucson in the Santa Catalina Mountains and with it he was able to uh, obtain many high resolution planetary and lunar photographs, the best ever taken from the ground. Uh, he helped to uh, also study observation uh, uh, possible observatory sites in Hawaii and Mexico and California and Chile and through his influence NASA funded the building of a telescope in Marina Kea in Hawaii in 1968. In 1960, while in Tucson, Koper published his orthographic atlas of the moon, and in 1963, his rectified lunar atlas. And in the early 1960s, NASA launched the NASA Ranger program. Uh, these probes were launched to the moon's surface and deliberately crashed, and their, their job was to photograph the lunar surface as they came into contact with the surface of the moon and radio pictures back to the Earth. So Koper, uh, was the chief scientist and principal in, uh, investigator and he edited a huge photographic atlas of these pictures and the atlas was used to choose a landing site for the Apollo missions. Uh, NASA served on, uh, sorry, Koper served on NASA committees and briefed high government officials on the space program and he correctly described to the astronauts uh, who would be landing on the moon that it would feel like uh, they would be walking on crunchy snow. In fact, uh, this was later confirmed by Neil Armstrong. But actually, um, one thing that Koper never did predict um, for the astronauts was the very warm reception they would receive from the Selenites. <laughs> I had to get that in there. <laughs> I had to sneak that in because that was uh, something I mentioned in my previous talk about Hevelius. Um, Google it, you'll see what I mean. There's a whole raft of, I, you know, if you want pictures of supposed selenites, just go under uh, Google pictures, images, and you'll have your heart's delight. Sorry, Cooper. Um, in 1967, uh, the NASA Convair 1990 aircraft was fitted with a telescope for infrared studies at 40,000 feet. And Cooper took observations from 1967 to 1968 and published an atlas of infrared solar spectra. And in his honor, uh, a one meter telescope on the C-141 aircraft was um, called the Koper Airborne Observatory in 1975. And in the early 1970s, Koper also worked on the Viking space probes uh, sent to Mars in 1975. Alas, uh, Koper died suddenly uh, while on vacation in Mexico with his wife and his dear friend, uh, fellow astronomer uh, Fred Whipple. He died of a heart attack there on December 24th, 1973. Um, far too early in his, in his career, he still had many miles uh, to journey. Uh, it was really a tremendous loss to the scientific community. Uh, he left behind his son and daughter, and in spite of his hectic career, uh, apparently they still had a very strong family unit. Um, but we remember him still in many ways. Uh, the Koper Belt, as I mentioned earlier, uh, named after him uh, in 1992, uh, the Koper Airborne Observatory, I just mentioned, in 1975. Uh, a Koper Prize was created by the American Astron Astronomical Society Division of Planetary Science. Uh, there's a minor planet, uh, 1776 Koper, it's named after him. And there are also craters on Mercury that are named after him, that's the one on Mercury, and Mars, and the Moon, the big one up at the top there. And many binary stars are still given a Koper number in his honor, KUI, whatever. And that's it. Well, we have time for a, um, some questions. If, any, if anyone has any anecdotes or any stories about uh, Kuiper that you, you, you might want to share uh, based on what you, what you read, maybe you can share them with us. Any questions? We can't see any hands. Jim, what do you think? Uh, I think there is a question here. Please speak up loud. That's fascinating that he was involved in assessing German scientists after the war as to their Nazi sympathies. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, there was a lot of uh, controversy about uh, Werner von Braun uh, at that time, and some people gave him a bad uh, you know, reputation for that. But apparently, uh, in a history I just read about him, that he was never a Nazi sympathizer. He, he actually got in trouble with Adolf Hitler, and he was the one that took his whole crew of scientists running to the American lines so they wouldn't get caught by the communists. And we can be thankful for that because 
he was the leading figure in uh, beating the Russians to the moon. Uh, did Kuiper have anything to do with, uh, do you know, uh, with uh, clearing him? That I don't know. That didn't come up in what I was reading. It was more of a, just a generalized, um, um, he just moved with the Allies, and as soon as they took over a university or some other uh, uh, you know, think tank that was scientific, uh, he, he started interrogating them. They were very worried, apparently, the Allies at that time, uh, that Germany had a lot more knowledge than actually they did uh, in the end, uh, especially nuclear uh, uh, warfare. They were very, very concerned. Other questions, comments? All right. Okay. Thank you. I can't imagine the amount of research Carmen put into this. Uh, tr tr truly, uh, truly amazing, Carmen. Thank you. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, uh, wow. Um, okay. Uh, next up is um, is Rob Dick. Rob was at Starfest recently, and Rob will tell you what Starfest is all about and some highlights uh, from Starfest as well. And by the way, uh, if you want to catch uh, Carmen's uh, presentation again. Um, we do uh, we we do stream this for we stream this presentation live over the internet for uh, this, the meeting live over the internet for those who can attend and and it, it's also made available um, uh, for uh, viewing later on it, it ends up on, on on YouTube okay Rob over to you Good evening How many people here have heard of Starfest about about a third or a half. Okay, how many people have been to Starfest? About the same number. Almost as though if you've heard of it, you've been there. If you haven't heard of it, you've never been there. Well, I'm going to talk a little bit of, very briefly about Star, Starfest. It's, it's not going to be a travel log. It's going to be about Starfest. And in doing so, I think it'll show you a different perspective perhaps than what, uh, what some of you already have. This is the controller. Right button. Right button, thank you. <laughs> so this is a picture of the campground and apologize for the blurriness. It was obviously taken from an airplane about the deep six it, perhaps. The main point, and the laser point is the top center, yes, is the main tent. And people start accumulating actually the beginning of the week. So it's a Starfest is usually on a sat on the weekend. People start coming in on Mondays and Tuesdays, and if they keep a don't keep a low profile, they get roped into actually setting things up. It's quite a Herculean effort to actually set all this stuff up, communications, tents, facilities, because really that's a blank field when they get almost blank field when they get there. So an awful lot of work, and it's run by the North York Astronomical Association. And they volunteer to do all this. So even though you have to pay a registration fee, it's to cover things like the rental of that marquee tent, which is an enormous tent, and so on. There's a few extra tents and so on. Even a swimming pool, that's already there. So why Starfest? Well, it's because it's there. North York Astronomical Association started this back in the 80s and it's been continuing and growing and it ebbs and flows a little bit as years go as years go on because of uh, the, the the weather when people can make it and, and so on most of the people that come are from the city of toronto for obvious reasons here's toronto and you drive up highway 1 400 and then you go down highway 89 to mount forest and north a bit and that's where star that's where starfest is held at the river park uh river Park Campground, I think it is. So it attracts astronomers from around the Golden Horseshoe and beyond. And when I say beyond, they can come as far as Florida, California, and throughout the states. Even some people come from Europe. And of course, the fair contingent comes from Ottawa. And the way we can get there, two ways. One is along the 401 into Toronto. And if you're a glutton for punishment, you take the 401 to the 400. If you like spending money, then you go up to the 407 and whip across uh, north of Toronto and get there in half the time, but it's still about six hour drive from Ottawa. Hence the problem for people from Ottawa. Well, this is what the light pollution looks like in this general area. So we have Toronto down here, and we drive up 400, then 89, here's Mount Forest, and this is where it is. And so what's interesting about the new light pollution maps, you got resolution down to about a kilometer. These are the brand new ones, circa 19, sorry, 2015 or so. This is from 2015 data. And what is neat is that you see all these little towns, but what's all this mottling about? 
Well, it's not really noise, but if you drive along that place, especially if you get there a little late and it's nighttime, you see all the, the barn lights, the outdoor lights, and so on. Homes in the middle of nowhere will have their light on, for example, and that just increases the general background lighting for the entire region. And this is where it is. It's not black sky. You get the, the light pollution in the south from Mount Forest, and of course, Toronto in the southwest or southeast. And if we go back to 2000 data, uh, 2012 data, you can see the resolution is nowhere near as good. But what's kind of neat is that when you compare the two, you're able to resolve this background into individual lighting areas where you can get lighting. And I use this for parks, for example, when they want to think about being a dark sky preserve. I can pull this stuff up and tell them where in the park the lights are coming from. And there's one that they might uh, consider changing the lighting to, the light, the light the skylight from the park is greater than that in the surrounding farmlands. And they consider that, dark, that park to be very, very dark. It turned out the park wasn't. If you want to get dark skies, you get away from the park. So that's my argument to them. And they've got arguments for me. So anyway, so that's the general area. And you can generally see that it's not black. It's not a black sky, it's not a really dark sky, but compared to uh, for Toronto and the surrounding area, it's pretty darn good. If you zoom in, then here's the 2012 data on the right-hand side, and on the left-hand side is the modern data, and you can see a glow around Starfest. And that's because Starfest has outdoor lighting. Now when Starfest hits, they shield those lights or turn them off or something, but they have seasonal campers. And what's growing like daisies are these little white um, uh, garden lights. And uh, they're bright white. And uh, white is the worst possible color you can possibly use. And they don't like astronomers there because, they, they, they have to turn, because the main lights are turned off. And they can't see at night, I guess. But anyway, that's roughly where, where it is. You zoom in and you can see the layout of the, uh, the, 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 the roadways inside the park and everything. And up here is generally where you have the seasonal campers. It also, there's a bit of a rise and, and, and tree lines up here. So that's also scattering light as well. So it's another, it's not just the lights, but it's also the lay of the land and the, and the vegetation. So, what if it's cloudy? Because you go, this go to this place for a dark sky, what if it's cloudy? And that's a problem, because when it's cloudy, it's cloudy. <laughs> so, what are you going to do? So, fortunately, one of the benefits of going to Starfest, apart from meeting old friends and making new friends, are the presentations that go on inside the tents. And there's several tents and different levels of presentations, different types of presentations. And that's, I guess, the intellectual stimulation you get as uh, in addition to the social stimulation you get from meeting new people. And if it's totally cloudy, then you get near Mike Dacey, who's an Ottawa Centre member. He sets up, oops, he sets up his tent and uh, show uh, science fiction movies into the night. <laughs> and uh, and it actually is pretty neat. Um, it used to be they used to play poker. So this is a little more agreeable, I think, for my disposition. So what if it's clear? Well, when it's clear, it's clear. And normally they've tried to pick Starfest around a, a nice weekend. This weekend, this year was around the new so it was around the new moon, and it's primarily the focus was the Perseid meteor shower. And you're able to sit back if you didn't have a telescope, telescopes are a problem or a nuisance to try to drag along and set up. So you just sit back and look at the meteors, look at the meteors. But there's plenty of other telescopes. Ottawa's Attila Danko regularly comes up and he brings his 25 inch. And if you want to find that, you look for the lineups. Beautiful scope, and of course, run by somebody who really knows the sky, knows the scope, and just quietly helps people through it. So there's lots of lineups. However, how about imagers? Well, it's now a green, it's now a red valley, because everything, everything and, a, and its dog has a red light on it. And literally, you can watch your, you can walk around with the light of the red lights all over the place. So it's not a place to, to really get dark adapted. It sounds kind of strange because we hear that red light is always good for astronomy. Well, when you can see red, your 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 night vision is about a thousand times uh, more sensitive in the red 
than when you're dark adapted than your daytime vision. Which means if you can see red, that means your daytime vision is seeing the red. That means you're blasting your night vision as well. So once you can see the color red, you're already damaging your night vision. And it's when you get down to these low levels, you got to use both types of vision together in trying to assess what color of light you should have. So the ubiquitous red lights are everywhere. And looking towards the north, we, this is looking towards the north here. And what do we have up there? Here's Perseus up here. And then you drip down to Cetus, the whale down here, triangulum up here. And you can see the sky isn't really dark. Well, this is the time exposure. It's actually darker than it looks there, but you still can see the, uh, the horizon, the lights on the horizon. If you look due south and you get the lights of, of Mount Forest and the, the stars and the, the sky glow of Toronto as well. But generally speaking, it's pretty good. Is it good enough to drive six hours? There's lots of nearby places to Ottawa that are darker skies and you only have to drive maybe two hours. And other people here can give a presentation about those sites uh, to encourage you to take advantage of them. Even Fred Lossing Observatory is pretty good. And that's all I have to say. Oh, by the way, if you're interested in next year, because of course it's too late to go now, right? Dumb me, I should have given this a couple of months ago. But if you want to go next year, I look up the Harold Smith Almanac for 2016. And the new moon is going to be, the Sarfest next year is going to be the last weekend in August. And the reason I got a 2016 copy is because there's a whole section on astronomy which I wrote. So watch out for this on the newsstand. And it, uh, that's a plug. I don't get paid for it, by the way, but I, I'd like to see more people read it, so they call me again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Um, I was going to ask you, who are, the, who are the speakers this year? Because they always bring in some pretty prominent speakers. And I, see, I seem to recall, because um, I didn't attend this, um, there was the uh, Vatican astronomer who was a yes. very interesting fellow. Yes, the, uh, the, I think the, I, I usually get turned off by a lot of the speakers. But this year, I read the bios. And, I, and there are two speakers I, I, I looked at and figured, ah, forget it. Then I read the bios and said, oh, i got to see this. Some of you might have heard the book about Turn Right at Orion. Well, the two authors that wrote that were there. And they're a remarkable pair. And one of them is a Vatican astronomer. And uh, he actually went through, he's a Jesuit priest and so on. So it's Father Guy, or Brother Guy, or whatever they call him. Sorry, I'm not that religious. <laughs> but he's a wonderful bunch. And the humor and the camaraderie they have, they have different personalities. And they kind of pick at each other, which is, rather, which is very entertaining. In the past years, they'd have eminent astronomers, very, uh, very well-known people, and sometimes you get people you'd never even heard of that are just aces. And there's one particular talk I heard a number of years ago. It's a woman that I'd never heard of, but she was the technical uh, lead for the Galileo telescope. And when she talked, it was riveting. And then she gave another talk about, she's also on the, uh, one of the Mars pro probes, and that was riveting, and uh, just a wonderful person. You look at her from about 100, 100 feet away, she looks like she's about 23. Not 23 when you get close, but she's got a whole <laughs> life of experience. She's a, but, but, but when you get, when you see, <laughs> am, I stick, am I in the hole here? But when you, when you read, if you visit the Starfest site, uh, when you see the list of speakers, don't take them at face value, uh, because there's more about them. Rob, you're live on the internet. <laughs> the speakers, some of the speakers that you never heard of will be the ones that you probably remember the most. And I suggest that for those of you who are able to go, it's a lot of it's camping, uh, but Plan for that for the end of August next year if you can. Thank you. Well, thank you, Rob. That's, uh, that's funny. Um, actually, they had a year ago, they had the, uh, the, uh, the person who was in charge of the Cassini imaging. Um, I keep forgetting her name. Uh, Carolyn Porkel. Carolyn Porkel. Yeah, I, boy, I'd love to bring her here to one of these meetings. Uh, if, uh, that was, that's sort of one of my dreams to bring her here. Um, pretty impressive what those organizers are able to do. 
Okay, uh, before we go to break here, I'm gonna talk about membership, membership benefits uh, uh, later on in the meeting. I wanted to say a couple of things here about, uh, there's a telescope clinic that we have coming up. Uh, for those of you who remember the last telescope clinic, it, the, the purpose of it is to offer individualized uh, support for people who um, maybe they're new to astronomy, they have a new telescope, or they have a telescope that's been sort of gathering dust rather than photons, um, and, and, they, want, and they, want, uh, they want help, uh, they want help with it. Perhaps they don't understand how to polar line it. Perhaps you don't understand, uh, you know, how, how to, uh, you know, what, what collimation is all about and, and, and so forth. Perhaps you're interested in astrophotography and you want to hook up your camera to it. So these are all the things that we did last time at the last telescope clinic. It is free. It's coming up on Saturday, September the 26th in the, in the afternoon. Um, because we expect to fill up on that, I have a sign-up sheet here. Um, so if you are interested, well, please leave your name. Your, uh, your email address, and uh, if, you're, if you're bringing a telescope or not, you do not have to have a telescope to attend. Perhaps you're interested in looking at the various types of telescopes and, 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 um, and, and want to, and want to uh, maybe get some advice on, uh, on something, that, that, uh, you know, that, that can happen as well. But um, advanced registration is required. We don't accept drop-ins, okay, because there's limited space. Next up is, uh, is uh, Chuck O'Dale. Chuck will be talking about his recent uh, uh, crater odyssey here, so Chuck. Over to you, Indiana. <laughs> so I guess you've all seen the, uh, the movie, Stanley Kubrick's movie from 1968. Well, we did a better one. <laughs> yeah, we, um, we're going to give you an impression of how many times our planet, especially Canada, has been hammered over the eons from uh, various things. and. Uh, Carmen's talk was an excellent segue because all the Kuiper Belt, uh, the Oort Cloud, the asteroids, they're whipping through our solar system and we have consequences because there's a whole bunch of holes in the ground around here. And uh, what I uh, wanted you to do, what I wanted to do was to give you an impression of just how many times we have been hit locally and across our planet. But um, you can see with, with what we got here, there seems to be a lot of blank areas where there's no craters. Well, geologists think that there's at least 340 other craters that have not been discovered on our planet yet. And the reason for these blank areas is just because we haven't studied them. Uh, North America has been prospected right, left, and center, oil, uh, minerals, etc. But uh, as you can see, there's parts of the planet that haven't been explored very well. Well, what's the best way of doing this? I had an opportunity come up, which was great. Uh, we had some members here, Peter and Deborah Cerevalo. They moved their business from Ottawa to uh, BC. Deborah, Peter, if you're watching, how you doing? Um, unfortunately, they left their airplane behind. So they called me up and said, Chuck, can you fly it out for us? Well. Jillian and I thought for a millisecond and said, yeah, what the heck, let's do it. <laughs> so, <clears throat> Ottawa to Osoyoos, where we went, and uh, on the way we uh, looked at some holes in the ground. So, hold on to your hats, here we go. My first uh, little uh, jaunt was actually up to uh, Georgian Bay in this area. Uh, there's a place called Croker Island. Now, a lot of people email me uh, with uh, sites they've seen, circular objects on the ground, thinking, oh, they must be craters. Can you take a look at them? Well, the one in Croker Island in Georgian Bay was one of them, so off we went straight to there. And on the way, first of all, we, we uh, flew by Brent Crater. Uh, Eric and I were up there a couple of years ago. And I just want to mention, off the wingtip, you see the fuzzy stuff. The time we took this picture was in August, and that was snow. That was cool. Now, I mentioned circular objects. Every time you see something circular, it is not necessarily a crater, because right beside Brent, just a little bit south, is a little uh, lake called Alcivert. And Eric and I uh, explored that. That, the one in the bottom, is not a crater. The one in the top, Brent, is a crater. So it just gives you an idea of the studies that geologists have to go through to uh, identify craters. So on the way we go, uh, this is Charity Shoal in Lake Ontario. We were almost sure it's an impact, but not 100% sure yet. 
And this object here is just south of Belleville on the um, Prince Edward Point. And I flew by that a while ago, took a picture of it and forgot all about it. But when I was going through my documentation, I saw that and I said, well, that's a place Eric and I have to go see sometime, right? Absolutely. So that's another one. Uh, just north of there is Holliford, that uh, crater. People, you can see a little wee uh, road going through it. People have been driving through that for years and years and years. Oh, it's just a little hill down we go and up we go until we've discovered, yes, in fact, it is an impact. Uh, uh, impact melts and other, other crystals. Uh, all, all these things that I'm documenting on this talk are documented on my website. So if you ha have any detailed questions, it, they're all there. Um, further on to the west is a, a, a lake called Scutamata. Now, I get many emails about this guy. Look how circular that is. It has to be a crater. Well, actually, it's a, an extinct uh, carb carbonatite volcano. It's a remnant of a volcano billions of years old. Now, there's a crater up in northern Quebec, Presqu'île, and they almost look the same. The guy in the upper uh, right is, in fact, an impact, and the one on the left is an extinct volcano. Mm. Kind of cool, isn't it? Further to the west again, Skeleton Lake. Uh, we're pretty sure that is a crater. Um, no firm evidence, we're 99%. And here we go up to Croker Island in Georgian Bay. Now look at that, that is a circular object that has to be a crater. Well actually what it is is a pluton. It's a uh, 1.5 billion year old crystallized magma. So flying around it, it is circular, look at that. That looks like a crater rim. And there's a central peak just under the, the wingtip. Wow. That's not the only pluton we've been fooled by, eh, Chuck? That's right. Uh, yes, uh, we have stories. <laughs> not enough time tonight, unfortunately. Uh, just to the south of there, I'll just go back a bit. Just to the south of Georgian Bay, you can see in, in Lake Huron, is uh, the Can-Am crater. It's under the water. It has not been studied because you have to drill. It's underwater, about uh, 200 feet of water. And of course, with the pristine Great Lakes, Governments are very reluctant to let people uh, drill in there to find uh, concrete evidence of an impact. But what we have is what's called an aeromagnetic signature, and there's gravity signatures as well that confirm very 99% again that is, in fact is an impact. So just in the bottom of Lake Huron, that circular area is an impact. A lot of people don't realize that. I didn't. So. Croker Island still heading west, and we're going up to Red Lake in northern Ontario. Well, why are we going there? Well, you'll find out in a second. On the way, um, we pass Lake Nipissing. and Lake Nipissing, we have two circular objects. The Manitou Islands and Calendar, that's a... Uh, and both of them are extinct volcano carbonate, car carbonatites, uh, the old extinct volcanoes. So here we are, a twin pair they had to be impacts, but no, the geologists have confirmed that they are, in fact, an extinct volcano. Further to the west, again, a couple of twin craters, but these, in fact, are impacts. Sudbury, 1.5 billion years old, and uh, Wanapatai is 37 million years old. Uh, twin craters, so if you're ever worried about getting bonked on the head by an impact, move to Sudbury, because chances of a third one hitting there are very, very, very low. But into uh, twin objects, like uh, in Lake Nipissing, the volcanoes, the two craters in, uh, just north of us. In northern Quebec, there's another pair. And for years, everybody thought this had to be a dual impact. And two major craters side by side like this, it couldn't be anything else but the same asteroid. But in fact, it's not. The, one, the, the larger one, 290 million years old, and the smaller one, almost twice as old. And who would have thought that two major objects would land so close together? This is the uh, crater rim between the two objects. You can see right there. The next picture, I was right here taking a picture looking this way. Quite the trip. But look at that. Now, that's two big holes in the ground. What's the chances? That blew me away when we found that out. And... What's that again? So much for your 
<laughs> yeah, right, there's two places. <laughs> Right, uh, don't go to Clearwater Lakes if you're, well, actually go to Clearwater Lakes if you're worried about getting bonked on the head. So here we go, uh, still heading to Red Lake, and one more crater to look at, the, the Slate Islands. That in fact is the central peak of a larger crater in northern Lake Superior. Uh, again, uh, Eric and I, uh, we, we explored that, and there's a giant shatter cone right about there. If anybody's ever in Slate Islands, you got to go see that shatter cone. It is awesome. Biggest one in the world. That's the biggest one we know of in the world so far. But yes, it's about 30 feet high. So here we are coming into Red Lake for the, our first uh, night. And if there's any um, inspectors, uh, air, uh, 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 inspectors, you'll notice that I've uh, got the uh, approach nailed for once. We had a, a great time there, uh, Red Lake. There's a nice little park and the pickerel there is awesome. So if you ever get to Red Lake, get the pickerel. And you can see we had lots of fun in Red Lake. So from Red Lake, we're heading west and we're going into Manitoba to see a, um, a, an object that they found by oil prospecting, one of the first ones I'll show you, a high rock lake. So from Red Lake, here we go from Ontario into Manitoba. Whoops, what's going on? Here we go. Uh, north of our route is uh, Sharon. That is a uh, possible crater. We're not sure yet. Uh, the circular object, the magnetic signature is very, very, almost sure that it's an impact, but no confirmation yet. Just south of there, West Hawk Lake is in fact an impact. There is lots of geological proof. So up to this point, you'll notice that there is a lot of uh, rocky um, uh, Canadian shield uh, visible. We're heading into the prairies now, where we have just, it's just covered by kilometers thick uh, regolith uh, from uh, uh, glaciers, rivers, wind, uh, just about every mountain that's been eroded over the millennia has been deposited in our prairies, our big food basket. And this is Lake Dubonnet, uh, just to the uh, 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 east of uh, Winnipeg. Again, we're about 60% sure that this is impact. So you can see we've got uh, quite a few uh, and we're not even out of Ontario yet. So here we are. Now this is the first one that was just uh, a, a recent uh, uh, discovery and uh, I had a list of them and fortunately with this trip I got them all. I was hoping that the weather would hold out and in fact it did. This is the uh, uh, magnetic anomaly signature of the red, uh, the high rock lake area. And this is what it looks like in ground zero. Is that where you found the obelisk? Uh, it's close. <laughs> <laughs> well, you said you were better than 2001, so I figured there's an obelisk. There's, uh, actually, uh, just be patient. There's stuff coming up here. <laughs> uh, and if that inspector is still in the audience, uh, the ceiling was a thousand feet, honest. <laughs> and Peter, it was, trust me. Okay, uh, just to the uh, west of High Rock Lake is the uh, St. Martin uh, crater. Uh, I explored that a long time ago. It's totally buried. It's one of the most pristine craters in Canada, but it's under about a uh, hundred meters of regolith. Uh, but it has been studied. But there's a very interesting uh, feature. Just to the north of it, uh, north of the crater is the Dauphin River. It comes out of the crater, hits the crater rim, makes a 180 degree turn and then follows the crater rim on its way to Lake Winnipeg. And uh, my hypothesis is that the, the 180 degree turn of this river is in fact caused by the crater and the crater rim geology. It hasn't been proved yet, but um, looking at that and that below you now is in fact what a meander looks like. This to me is not a natural meander, it is a change in the river because of the crater. It hasn't been proved yet and I've, uh, if anybody writes a paper on that, I'll be famous. But just a bit of trivia uh, regarding meanders. If you take the uh, length of a river from its source to its uh, output, multiply it by pi or 3.14159, you'll get the, almost the true length going through all the meanders. Just a bit of trivia for you there. Anyway, so we're uh, heading south from St. Martin into uh, uh, southern Manitoba, a crater called Hartney. And again, 
It was uh, discovered by oil prospectors. The, uh, the seismic contours uh, very, very indi indicative of an impact, and that's ground zero. Uh, ground zero in the prairies is prairies. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, basically, uh, we're looking at some of these uh, impact, some of these features are about a kilometer deep, but uh, uh, with oil prospecting and so on, you can actually uh, see the, the, the circular signatures. So from uh, Manitoba, we head into Saskatchewan, and Saskatchewan seems to be wall-to-wall -wall impact craters. The first one we're going to visit is Dumas, again from oil prospecting, we're looking at here the, uh, the seismic uh, signature, very circular, very indicative, and uh, uh, even the 3D uh, picture, it has a central peak. So uh, hopefully they'll find some uh, um, impact melt or uh, uh, a koi site is another impact related geology. Uh, has been found yet, but uh, we're looking. And again, these are uh, impacts or, or uh, features that have just come up. And fortunately, with this trip, uh, I had them all listed out, and Julie and I did see them all, every one of them. So I'm just going to go through the, uh, the, the ones in Saskatchewan, how Saskatchewan really got hammered. Uh, first of all, up north is Car... Uh, whoops, there's Dumas. That's the, uh, again, point, point zero right underneath the wingtip. All GPS measurements, I had the GPS all set up and I just pointed the wing and took the picture. So north uh, is Carswell, that's a gigantic crater way up in uh, almost uh, in Athab Lake Athabasca. And actually around here you can see the uh, sand dunes. It's wall-to-wall -wall sand dunes up there, kind of cool. Uh, Gao, again we're in the Canadian Shield again. And Deep Bay, just in north of Saskatchewan, Canadian Shield, back into the prairies. Uh, view field. Now these impacts, uh, again, uh, with the geology and the uh, prospecting, you'll notice all these white little dots here. These are all uh, oil wells. So the impacts uh, do seem to have uh, uh, a concentration of uh, petrochemicals, which is good or bad, whichever way you look at it. Uh, here's Elbow, uh, just uh, up, um, you can see in, in mid Saskatchewan. Uh, it's a little wee circular object just off to the over here. But I wanted to uh, point out this is a gigantic dam here. It's called an em embark embarkment dam. It's one of the largest ones in the world. Uh, I thought that would be more interested in than showing you point zero. And right behind it is uh, Lake Diefenbaker. And I just want to brag a bit. Uh, uh, Mr. Diefenbaker, our 13th Prime Minister, I just happened to meet him 56 years ago. Um, here's Deef, and that's me, 14 years old, 56 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Deef was just at the point of signing the paper, canceling the arrow when I interrupted him. I was in the back there yelling, don't do it, Deef. <laughs> but. I don't know, he didn't listen to me. <laughs> anyway, we had a lake named, uh, lake, lake named after him anyway. Uh, Maple Creek, uh, just to the west. And here's a, uh, uh, an interesting uh, structure. Uh, when you're looking at Google Earth all the time, if you've got too much time on your hands, if you look at Touchwood Hills Park up in uh, Saskatchewan, it is a semicircular object. Uh, to my knowledge, nobody has prospected there to see if it, in fact, is impact related. Unfortunately, we couldn't get that far north to take a look at it, so I do not have any aerial pictures of it. But this is a, um, a map from back in the Ice Age when Lake Agassiz was uh, uh, covering the prairies. And you'll notice the circular lake, uh, reminiscent of the Manicouagan Circular Lake in northern Quebec. So it's there. If there's any geologists out there looking, maybe you'll be famous if you can prove that, in fact, is an impact. I'd love to get there and take a look at it. So our second stop, Moose Jaw, a uh, nice little town to uh, spend the night at. We uh, spent the night at a uh, revamped uh, CN hotel. It was awesome, uh, 20s de deco, uh, it was great. 
And uh, Jill, we had lots of fun there. Jillian's namesake, uh, we, we actually saw. Oh, really? Yeah. So, from uh, Moose Jaw off uh, into Alberta, uh, Purple Springs, and again we have uh, the seismic signature of a, of a crater. Point zero, sure looks like a crater, doesn't it? But it's buried under, you know, uh, almost 100 meters of uh, regolith, so. Uh, no proof yet, but you never know. Bow City. Um, just recently, you may have seen uh, uh, some papers published. Uh, they, they've uh, proven 90% that this, in fact, is impact. Uh, the seismic signature, you can see right here, the, uh, the crater signature. And they, they dated it because of the layers that were not uh, impacted by the crater. Um, uh, the, the signature, again, is circular. and point zero under the wing. So uh, they did find some pseudo crater geology in there. Uh, it's not complete yet. I haven't seen all the papers, but uh, we are almost sure that it is in fact an impact. And this is close to Calgary, yeah? Yeah, uh, yeah actually, um, there's Calgary there. Calgary, where are you? Here we are. Bow City, just down in here. So on the way, uh, of course, we flew over Vulcan. <laughs> Pearl, love that place. <laughs> and up north to James River, just north of Calgary. Again, the uh, seismic signature. Uh, the final one that uh, was recently documented for us, and in fact, that we did, did get the uh, uh, point zero under the wing. So uh, the weather did cooperate. We saw them all. So I was very, very happy about that. I know Jillian was very excited in the right seat that we got it all done. And just north of there, a couple of years ago, uh, Jillian and I actually did uh, explore the White Court Crater. That's us in the bottom of it, uh, just enjoying life, just great. So, we, again, we just to the north of Calgary is the uh, airport Airdrie. We spent the night there. I actually uh, spent the night with my sister. It was great to see her again. Then from Calgary, our last leg off to Os Osoyoos in, in BC, where Peter has moved his business. Peter and Deborah have moved their business. So, hitting the mountains, uh, I just had to take pictures of the Frank slide. Uh, the first picture on the, on the left is looking west going into the mountains, and that is one heck of a lot of rock that fell off that mountain. It just, just, just blows you away. And then further in, on the, uh, on the right, looking back, you can actually see the flat prairie. Looking left, looking west, you can see the mountains. So it was just a, a chop from the prairies into the mountains. But uh, that whole mountainside coming off like that was, was uh, just a, a disaster, actually. It looks like it just happened. Yeah, actually, I just jumped out there to take a quick picture. <laughs> actually, uh, uh, it did. It's, uh, what, it's almost 60, no, almost 100 years ago now, eh? I can't remember. Anybody? 1909. 19, okay, yeah. But after 100 years, nothing's grown. Yeah, that's right. Um, where I t where we, actually, Jillian and I did drive through there uh, two years ago, and that's right about there is where I took that picture. That rock uh, came off the top of the mountain, so you could just imagine the energy that thing had when it was rolling down. Just south of the Frank slide is another feature. Now I mentioned at the beginning there's no uh, craters that we found in the mountains. This is one of them, and the reason for it is of course the mountains got squished up, uh, subducted and so on, so any uh, feature is totally erased because of all the geological uh, happenings there. But this Howell Creek crater, this uh, was studied maybe about 20 years ago and I haven't found any um, uh, uh, correspondence or studies about it since. But what it is, first of all, this is a picture my son and I took uh, when we flew over there in uh, April, uh, about 15 years ago. And the part I want you to keep uh, concentrating on is just this area here. The hypothesis is, if you see that circular part at this point, the hypothesis is, is that it's a uh, fossilized slump. Now when you get a crater, you get the impact, all that energy 
vaporizes, blows out a very bowl shape. But the bowl shape itself is very unstable, and within minutes, the walls collapse because they just can't support each other. And it's, it's like a mud wall. It just can't support the, the, the sudden uh, uh, pressures, the pressure release, and they slump down. So the hypothesis is here is that this area is, in fact, a fossilized crater rim. The studies have stopped, uh, uh, and I haven't found anything else since. You can see <coughs> the fault line here, <coughs> excuse me, which actually cuts the crater in half, that's that fault line right there. So right here possibly is the uh, fossilized rim of a very large impact. So if there's any geologists out there looking, that's something we might want to look at in the future. So getting close to uh, Osoyoos, uh, we flew over the Dominion Radio Astrophysical Observatory and uh, was tucked in a nice little valley there, sound uh, noise, noiseless, I guess, for their uh, research. And our final landing, I miss that. <laughs> anyway, we had a great, great flight. And there's Peter uh, on the right, very happy to see his bird in one piece. <laughs> yeah, we had a great trip. So, just to uh, give you a, uh, an appreciation of what we did and, and uh, how many times we've been hit, uh, just going across Canada, you can see just here how many craters I've documented. So you just imagine what's yet to be discovered. So, uh, Carmen, as you mentioned, uh, the Oort crowd, uh, the Kuiper belt, these objects are flying through our solar system, right, left, and center. Let's just hope they keep missing us. And uh, people ask me uh, why we have a space program. Well, my answer is, well, just ask a dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just going to follow up a couple of things. Um, and Peter and Deborah have a great place out, uh, their business out in BC. Uh, this is the view from the backyard. Now, we all heard about the uh, forest fires. And last month, the view from that uh, backyard is that. Yeah. To my knowledge, everything's okay. So uh, they did okay. And this was uh, just across the U.S. border. The, their observatory is right uh, maybe 10 kilometers north of the U.S. border. And this fire here is in the U.S. So that was quite the, quite the trip. Loved it. Thanks for your attention. It was great. <laughs> Yeah. So any questions for Chuck? Um, any, any observations? Uh, maybe Chuck, uh, do you have, what's on your bucket, what remains on your bucket list of uh, impact crater sites to see? There, there's actually a couple of features in Quebec that uh, I want to fly to. And Eric and I have two objects we're going to explore very shortly on the ground with this canoe. And we'll probably present that uh, very shortly. Uh, we hope to do it this summer, but uh, things happen. Trips like this, uh, we just couldn't get into it. But uh, we're going to get there, Eric. Whenever you're ready, Chuck. Roger, rock and roll. Any questions? One up here. Yeah, go for it. Uh, sorry, I just didn't quite catch the scale of the Touchwood um, potential uh, structure. Like, how big would Touchwood? Okay. Yeah, let's uh, let's go back there. I think it's you're looking at maybe 200 kilometers across. So, you know, it is a circular feature. Again, uh, you know, with an engineer with too much time on his hand looking at Google and Earth, you find these objects. So uh, it's bigger than Manicouagan. So who knows? Uh, it, it'd be a cool. If you ever get up to the Torchwood Hills Park, look at the, look at the rocks. You might get famous <laughs> if you find a shadow cone. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, any more? One more question. Yeah? I'm just curious how many kilometers you put on Peter's plane. <laughs> you know, I had that, and oh golly, I had it on the GPS, and I, I can't tell you. Uh, How many hours, Chuck? Um, pum 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 pum. Uh, two, 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 two. I'd say ten times four, forty, ish. Strange the bird fly, right? Yeah. <laughs> and the weather was great. Uh, we got the bugs off the wings a couple places, but anyway, great airplane, Peter. Thank you very much, Chuck.
171, Chris. Okay, we're doing really, really good here. Chuck, that was, that's, thank you so much for sharing your, uh, your, your odyssey there. Um, next up is the observation reports um, from our, our members. Uh, we've got Gordon, Janet, uh, Michael, and uh, presenting on behalf of, of Paul uh, Commission is uh, Paul Clowinger. So first up is uh, Gordon. Good evening. Um, leafing through some of my sketches in preparation for something Janet's going to talk about here in a minute. Um, I came across this one that I did last year. Uh, it's <clears throat> done with a white uh, pastel pencil on black paper, which is fun to, to work with. It, it just works a lot faster and it's, it's got a lot more contrast. Can we get all the lights, please? Get all the lights, please, Chris. There we go. Is that better? Yeah. Uh, this one was done just, just uh, a couple weeks ago uh, with my 120 refractor and M57. And just it had a really nice, I, I was really pleased with this sketch because it, whoops, sorry. There we go. Because it picked up the, uh, a, a real three dimensional quality. And last but not least, uh, NGC 6905, it's uh, the Blue Flash Nebula in Delphinus. And <clears throat> what I noticed when I was looking at it is that there, there appear to be dark lanes in there. It's all, almost like the Owl Nebula. So that's it, thanks. Okay, next up is, uh, I believe, Janet. Janet. Right button, John. Okay, thanks. Uh, the slide that you're looking at here, I've called the uh, the end of summer skies. Uh, I'll uh, just go over the technical information first. Um, I took it Sunday, September the sixth at uh, 11:35 p.m. Uh, with my Canon EOS Mark II using a um, an ioptron guider. Um, ISO speed was to 1250 at f4 and the exposure time was 32 seconds. Um, it's located uh, on Lac Leslie in Quebec which is approximately uh, 47 degrees latitude and seven, minus 72 degrees longitude. Now um, because there's so many um, constellations and interesting sky objects in here, Chris has uh, drawn a couple of outlines for us, so I'm just briefly going to uh, touch on those. The first is the Pleiades, of course, which is a major star cluster uh, and is um, about 425 light years from Earth. It's also known as the Seven Sisters. Um, and it, of course, contains uh, way more stars than just seven, but it has uh, a really ancient pedigree and was mentioned by Greek authors in uh, some of our earliest Western literature in a poem by Hesiod and also Homer's Iliad and the Odyssey. Uh, next, we have uh, the constellation Perseus. Um, where am I here? Right, uh, again, named after a famous Greek hero who uh, beheaded the snake-headed uh, Medusa. And uh, the constellation, of course, is the radiant point of the Perseid meteor shower, which occurs every August. Its brightest star is uh, Alpha Perse, which is up here. And, uh, um, uh, it's part of a, a much larger, this star is part of a, a much larger uh, star cluster. Uh, next up we have Taurus the bull, of course, and uh, it was called the um, heavenly bull in ancient Babylonian mythology, and uh, to the ancient Egyptians it represented uh, the sacred bull. Uh, it is, of course, one of the 12 signs of the zodiac, and its brightest star is Aldebaran, which is here. 
And uh, it also boasts uh, a number of interesting objects, including the, uh, the Hyades, which are there. And uh, this group of stars is actually mythologically related to the Pleiades. Uh, both were thought to be uh, young women who were fathered by um, the Titan Atlas. And what else did I want to say? Oh yes, about, about the Hyades, it's uh, the closest star cluster, actually open star cluster to the planet Earth and um, has been uh, very well uh, studied. And lastly, we have Auriga, uh, which means charioteer in Latin. And uh, it contains uh, a couple of uh, star clusters. Uh, M38 is somewhere here, 36 here. And it also uh, contains a very faint nebula called the Flaming Star Nebula. Um, its brightest star is Capella, of course, which is up here. And uh, Capella is about 42 light years from Earth. And the name is a diminutive of the word capra, which uh, means she-goat. And there is a little asterism here, which is frequently called the kids, as in the kids of the she-goat. The reason why I uh, called this image uh, the end of the summer skies is because the Pleiades um, have uh, appear, they're visible in the northern hemisphere um, at the dawn and early spring, and they, uh, in autumn, they set uh, in, in the dawn, and so for the ancients it marked the beginning of seafaring and farming and also the season of war, and their setting in uh, dawn and autumn marked the end of those seasons. So next slide, please. Um, I just want to take one minute or less to advertise a course that's coming up that will be uh, taught by Gordon Webster and myself at the Ottawa School of Art. It's called Art and Astronomy. And uh, we're going to be teaching it, it uh, the first, uh, the full moon, the weekend of the full moon in October, which I believe is the 23rd, sometime between the 23rd and the 25th. Uh, it's an introductory course, just looking at different approaches to the night sky. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and this is one of the images uh, of Gordon's, and if you're interested in taking this workshop with us, you'll learn a lot about both different artistic approaches to the night sky as well as a little bit of introductory uh, astronomy. So if you're interested, please talk to Gordon and I after the meeting. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Janet. Um, maybe Janet and you and Gordon could come up to the uh, front after the meeting so if people have any questions about that course, they, they can. Uh, next up is um, Michael Banks. Michael. Hello, everyone. Uh, so this is obviously Saturn. Uh, probably not the best version of Saturn you've ever seen, granted. Uh, but I took this at the star party in July, and I took it with my iPhone. Yes, now I had a little help from Eric with his big telescope, obviously. Um, but the whole time he was chiding me because I was trying to take it through the eyepiece and he's like, oh no, you can't do that at all, that's never gonna work. And for about five minutes he was berating me about how stupid this idea was. Um, but then I managed to get it and then he was like, oh, okay, never mind, it's awesome. Um, so he encouraged me to submit it for the RASC meeting tonight. Um, so Saturn from an iPhone. Very cool. All right, next up is um, Paul Commission, and uh, Paul Clowinger will be presenting on his, on his behalf. Paul, uh, if you're watching tonight, uh, you're always welcome here. Uh, you're a big part of the RASC Ottawa Center. Well, I think he's watching tonight. Hi, Paul, how are you? Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, yeah, it's my pleasure to uh, present a, a couple of images taken by, uh, by Paul recently. 
for those of you that know Paul, know that uh, he's had uh, a few health challenges in the last little while, and that's kept him away from his, uh, his uh, telescope a bit. But uh, he's, uh, he appears to be on the mend. He's feeling better, and uh, certainly better enough uh, to, uh, to get out and uh, start working with his scope again. And he wanted me to say hi to everybody tonight from him. So this is, this is from you, Paul. Hi, everybody. Say hi to Paul. So as, he is, as I said, he is feeling better and uh, so over the summer I've been helping him get his uh, telescope back up and, uh, and, and operational. And uh, so this is one of the first images that he took uh, just back in uh, July there of the, uh, of the uh, Ring Nebula. And uh, I put it beside one of the shots from the Hubble there and you can see that it's actually a pretty good correspondence when you look at some of the faint details there, considering this is the Hubble and this is Paul's 14 inch in Barhaven. So yeah. Slightly different budget there too, but uh, good shot, uh, <laughs> good shot on on that one. And uh, uh, yeah, we were very pleased with the results there. His uh, his his uh, his observatory needed a little work while while he was on hiatus. The uh, squirrels decided to do a little observing, so I had to evict them. Uh, but uh, they're out of there now, and so uh, so everybody's happy, and uh, and Paul's back in the in 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 observing mode. The other one that we shot, uh, we just shot about uh, a week and a half ago, and uh, that's this one. You can see, as, uh, again, those of you that know Paul know that he likes the faint fuzzies, right? Am I right, Paul? Well, this is a faint fuzzy, again, shot from, from Barhaven. This is uh, NGC 6560. This, uh, this is a very distant galaxy, uh, about 320 million light years from here. And uh, this galaxy, if, uh, just to put things in perspective, for those of you that have done observing and have ever looked at Venus through an eyepiece there, when Venus is a nice crescent, that galaxy is no bigger than that. And certainly a lot fainter because it's at magnitude 13.4. So a very faint galaxy and we picked this up uh, with this 14 inch and the universe camera uh, with uh, three minutes of exposure, believe it or not, and a little bit of processing. I helped him with that. but. Um, Anyway, at, at 86 years old, it's really, really nice for me to see that uh, he's still looking at galaxies far, far away. So good to see you back in the saddle there, buddy, and thanks for the images. Thank you. Thank you, Paul and Paul. Um, boy, boy our, our, our screen and projector is nice. I just, I just, just was looking at this uh, ring nebula. Boy, that's nice to look at here. On our screen. Okay, next up is um, just as we go towards our final stretch here, uh, is our observer challenges segment uh, is Bob Olson. How are you doing? Um, I have one complaint about Rob Dick's presentation, actually. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if you take a picture of me, Rob, use Photoshop and make me look skinnier, would you please? <laughs> uh, the observing challenge uh, for the uh, novices is M. 31, which is uh, the Andromeda Galaxy. And it also comes with two other uh, M Messier objects, uh, 32 and uh, 110. So I know you're all working on your Messier lists after last month's talk. So here's three that you can add right now. Uh, how do you find it, though? Well, it's, uh, there's M M31 right here. And uh, if I just emphasize the uh, constellations that you really care about, it's uh, Cassiopeia, which is the w, easiest constellation in the, in the world to find after the Big Dipper, and Andromeda, which is a little harder, but still pretty easy to find once you've got, uh, once you've got Cassiopeia. A little close-up view. Um, and, uh, again, Cassiopeia up here and Andromeda. And the way you find it, the way I've always found it is, it's about five of these triangles straight ahead. And uh, if you want a better line, then you, you might uh, take these two stars and go straight up through there, and uh, you'll be on it then too. Um, you know, the best thing to look at is in binoculars, and that's, a, that's your field of view in binoculars. Get somebody with a green laser, point in this general area with it, and follow the beam up with your binoculars. It's, a, it's so easy to do. When I'm looking through binoculars, every star looks exactly the same. And so this is a little trick to get to it easily. And uh, this is, again, a close-up view, uh, still binocular view. And uh, you can see Andromeda 32 and uh, 
110. Uh, I think you can see 32 with binoculars, but I'm not sure about 110. It's pretty, pretty faint. And uh, that's what it looks like in a nice three inch telescope. Maybe the best thing to look at it with a little three inch telescope. And again, a lot of us have uh, Schmidt uh, Cassegrain eights or nine inch scopes. And uh, that's what it would look like in, in, a, in one of those scopes, uh, the little tiny circle. So let's just go a little tighter here. That's the um, Celestron 9, which is basically a Schmidt uh, F10 scope. And uh, that's what you see. And you will notice that 32 and 110 are outside your field of view. So you've, you know, if you want to see all three of them, you need some way of getting to them. And uh, let's just take a look here now. This is what you actually look at, look, what it looks like. It doesn't look like that when you look at a telescope. It looks like this. Uh, I looked at it about a week ago and sort of adjusted my picture to fit that. And let's go back here now. One, one of the interesting things about this is, see that line right there? That goes right to the North Star. So on your telescope, if you have an equatorial mount, that's up and down. So get on the galaxy, go up and down a bit, and you're going to run across 32. No problem. You know, it'll, it'll be pretty easy to spot. Once you have 32, you know where it is, go back to Andromeda, and now it's on the other side. And it's up, at, it's up perpendicular to the axis of the, uh, of the uh, galaxy. So you're going to go up like that. And you can see the scope, it's just, just barely out of the view, and you can find it. Now, it's a little fainter, though. It's a little tougher to find. Uh, again, this is what it looks like in my camera. And this is what it looks like in my eyepiece. And there's the field of view of a, a Schmidt Cassegrain telescope. All right. My advanced uh, object is M74. I'm not going to go in very much how to find it, just show you where it is. Uh, you know, go Google it. Uh, they'll give you all kinds of nice finder charts. And it's, when I did, uh, when I found all my 110 messy objects, this was the last one I found. I looked for it, I think a thousand times, and I couldn't see it. So this is what it looked like when I looked at it the other night through my eyepiece. And I just couldn't, it didn't show up. I looked at M51, which is a pretty easy galaxy to see too, and it was a little, little faint too, but I mean, I could easily see it. This one just vanished. It's called the Phantom for a good reason. And when I whacked a camera on my lens, that's what I saw. So, you know, this is what I saw, this is what I imaged. So it's pretty freaking faint. Good luck. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. So if anyone has any ideas for uh, the next month's uh, Observer Challenges, or if anyone would like to volunteer for it, l let me know. I'm, um, I'd like to almost have themes or, or something. And again, it's nice to have a, both a novice and a, uh, an advanced uh, Observer Challenge. OK, um, just a couple of things, a couple of announcements, a couple of uh, things uh, uh, to share for uh, people who haven't been here before. Um, for those of you who are interested in membership, let me just say a couple of things. We've got, uh, what I'd like to mention is that we have a telescope loan library. It operates very much like a, a, a typical law library, where you send us, except instead of signing out books, you sign out, um, you sign up telescopes. A great way to try before you buy, if you choose to. Um, we also have an observatory as well in the bottom there. You can, you can see that, and that's available for, for, for members. Um, we provide uh, instruction on how to use the uh, telescope and how to access it, it as well. We've got a, a library, an astronomy book library, just right behind the theater here. If you're, a, if you're not a member, you're welcome to take a look and see what it's all about. If you're a member, you can sign up. You can actually sign up books. Um, a wonderful resource. With, with membership comes um, a subscription to, uh, annual subscription to uh, the, uh, Canada's Astronomy Magazine, Sky News Magazine, we electronic version or of the, of the uh, REAC Journal, wonderful observer's handbook, and, uh, and uh, Astronauts, which I'm sure many of you notice has really come along uh, last uh, couple of years is really picking up steam. Um, very impressive. Uh, I know we all have a lot to of reading options, but uh, I'm fine and I'm reading the astronauts re religiously now. Um, really well done, I think. If you're interested, uh, adult membership is, is $75. If um, there is a, a, a family membership, which is a bit of a, um, a bargain, if you wish, uh, first member is uh, 70 and then, uh, and then there's an incremental uh, charge and so forth. Uh, youth under, under uh, 21 is uh, $45. Okay. 
uh, any questions, come see me. You can sign up online uh, at rasc.ca. Uh, our annual dinner, okay, let me say a couple of things about uh, a couple of events coming up. Our, our annual uh, dinner, which is uh, open um, to uh, the public as well, is, is uh, coming up on, uh, when is it coming up? November the 20th, okay. Uh, we, in, it's a $45 charge, which includes a buffet dinner and a speaker, which I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, Kristen Facio, Facio, Facio. And um, she is an engineer from uh, uh, McDonald Detweiler Associates, a uh, robotics engineer, and um, and uh, she'll be uh, she'll be talking about robotics and in uh, in, uh, in space exploration. Okay, so uh, we do have a, another star party. If there are those of you who are interested in in, in, in uh, checking out our schedule, it, you can just go to that uh, tinyurl.com rac rac party. Um, it, as it was before, it's in the uh, as it, it, it has always been in the last couple of years. It's in the uh, par uh, parking lot of the CART branch of the Ottawa Public Library, right beside the uh, Diefenbaker site. Um, we have a map that's posted on our on our, on our website uh, with, with directions, and our observing site is in, in the uh, bottom tier of the uh, the parking lot here, right there. So this, as I said at the beginning of the meeting, this has just been a spectacular year for star parties. Um, usually we get rained out or clouds, uh, you know, we'll have a primary date and then a couple of backup dates and we don't, we, we don't, we miss a month or sometimes we even miss two months. This year we've just, our first date we've hit, uh, uh, what is that, uh, five out of six times, okay. So the next, uh, the next star party is uh, scheduled on October the 3rd. That's a Saturday, October 3rd. It's right after our next um, monthly meeting on the and uh, of course, if it's cloudy on the third, we have backup dates on the 9th, 10th, and 11th. So we're, we're going to try and get. Uh, 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 we'll, we'll, we'll hopefully, we'll get a, one in on um, in October. Usually, our October event is the uh, biggest of the year, I find. Um, and uh, well, man, I think we we had over 400 people at the uh, at the last star party in September. So hold your hold your horses. This this could be a big one here. Actually, to be honest, it's getting so big. I'm actually starting to think that maybe we might need to change venues. So um, interesting. It's a good. It's a. It's a good thing, but it's also a bit of a worry here, you know. So, um, okay. So Estelle, our our librarian, our, our astronomy book librarian, has a, a select uh, book of the month. It's the universe. Uh, it's available for sign out. Um, and again, it's just right behind the. There's a, some doors here in the back. You can go and check out the library. Again, I encourage even if you're not a member, just to check and see what it's all about. Um, if you want to reach some of our our. our um, our, uh, our associates, if you want to call them that, um, people, uh, the Fred Lossing Observatory Director is Ron St. Martin, and uh, and so forth. I didn't mention earlier that uh, I did not mention that you can actually get uh, Sky and uh, Sky and Tell and Astronomy Magazine uh, at discount rates. So if you go to this address here, uh, you you can um, you can actually uh, set, click on a number of those names, and you'll get to uh, you click on those names, and you, you can uh, send them an email and say I'd like to inquire about or either. I'd like to use the, um, the, the I'd like to be, be able to use the uh, Fred Lossing Observatory, or I'd, I'd like to inquire about getting a discount magazine and so forth. Uh, we do stream um, these, as I said earlier, and, and record these uh, meetings. Uh, uh, it's it's uh, streamed and uh, recorded here. We also on that link there, um, and it's uh, in a couple of weeks. Typically, we post um, the older meetings on on YouTube. By the way, Eric, I'm going to put you on the spot. Was are the June and July meetings on YouTube yet? Uh, June and July are, August will be this week. Okay, terrific, okay, th thanks. Uh, thanks for doing that, I know it's a lot of work, Eric. Um, for those of you who wish to see, read uh, or, or review the uh, meetings, so there, is, there is a link on our webpage. Now, actually, I should mention our webpage is uh, courtesy of Chuck O'Dale, who's doing a ton of work. It, we're, we're actually changing, uh, from moving from one platform to, to another, so it'll be a lot um, slicker looking uh, website, so you'll notice some transition where we go as we go from uh, one to the other. But on there, there, there will be, there are, I know on our old one, and I'm sure Chuck is making this happen as we, probably as we speak, um, he's, um, uh, there, there's a link to um, videos, uh, that um, YouTube videos, okay, so if you want to, uh, rec recordings of the meetings. Um, 98 people tonight, not too bad for September. I want to thank everyone uh, for all the presenters, and I know I put you under a bit of time pressure here. Uh, lots of material, so th thank you for that. Um, any uh, questions and comments, let me know. 
Okay, our next meeting, just as a reminder, okay, to everyone, we are changing to 7.30, okay? So we typically have, we have started in the past at eight o'clock. We are now moving to a 7.30 start and, we're, and we'll go for two hours, so 7.30 to 9.30. So I'll be sending out emails, we'll be posting all over the web and uh, sending out reminders and so forth. So we're starting earlier for now. And then give some feedback, what, what you think about uh, uh, what, that's, uh, what that's all about. Uh, some animation there from, uh, okay, just the last few slides and when we're, when we're done. Um, I want to talk about, the, I'm quite excited about the uh, next two meetings. Um, the, um, the October meeting, um, bringing in a uh, First Nations speaker who's going to talk about Cree, uh, the, the, the Cree uh, sky and the mythology of the, uh, uh, the uh, Cree um, sky. And uh, Wilfred Buck, uh, he, he's, uh, he, there's a lot of very positive testimonials about his talk. He's gonna, it's going to be some song. It's going to be, as I said, he's going to talk about sort of mythology of the stars and so forth. Um, it should be interesting. Uh, Pierre Martin, we had hoped to squeeze him into this month to give his Perseid report. As everyone knows, Pierre is a, um, a meteor enthusiast, meteor shower enthusiast. Coming up in November, uh, we also have another speaker, um, Ivan Semeniak. And Ivan is a widely known uh, journalist who, is, is written, who, and, uh, who has written and produced, uh, produced uh, television sh shows on astronomy and so forth. Ivan is a gifted speaker. I heard him at the Calgary Center uh, back in May, and I've heard him deliver this talk here. He's going to talk about current research on dark matter. And uh, Ivan, uh, because he's, uh, he's, been, he's been able to get himself into locations, and he's been able to access some very prominent researchers, and uh, he's, is, uh, he's a very gifted speaker, and they're able to con uh, convey some, some of the more complex ideas uh, very, very effectively. So I'm looking forward to that. Ivan Semenyak and uh, Wilfred Buck were supported by um, our ASC national office uh, uh, grants. So um, we're, we're fortunate to have, some, you know, uh, to be able to access that money. And obviously your membership is, helps pay for that as well. So I, I am, I'm quite ple pleased about that. Um, post meeting, there is a social event at uh, Perkins. That's at, at, at Saint Laurent and Ogilvy. It's the big green looking restaurant um, at, the, um, at the corner there. Everyone's welcome. There's a big, huge room that we typically fill up. So if you want to talk about uh, just about anything, astronomy or anything, you're, you're welcome to attend. And then I think that's it. We're going to move to door prize. So the meeting's closed for those folks in internet land. Uh, internet land, glad you could join us. Now we're going to uh, we're going to um, call out the uh, door prizes. All right. So thanks everyone for joining.